meeting is called to order at 7.06. Please rise and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Businesses to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Okay, the motion is seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, our next order of business is the approval of the open session minutes from December 10, 2018. Motion to approve the agenda for the session minutes from two, uh, December 10, 2018. Second. Motion seconded. Um, is there any discussion? I gave Kelly some edits to like surface level edits. Mm -hmm. Beyond what we've read here? Or? In the minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, just to see confirmation. Can I just ask a question related to something that was discussed? The um, person from, I think his name is Mr. Ross, maybe? Yes. yes. That asked about the buddy bench. I was wondering what ended up happening with so that. So we're planning on connecting within the week. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. <laughs> okay, so it's been motioned and seconded. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nay. And you guys have it in the minutes or approved as amended. Um, student comments. Lily, do you have a report for us? I do. Um, last week on Friday, Mimic hosted an alumni fair, welcoming back recent graduates to meet with students. Approximately 20 alums met with the members of the STEM and Humanities Scholars Program, and the students had the chance to rotate their groups using guiding questions to pick the brains of our graduates about college life, academic experiences, transition to employment, and other postgraduate plans. Um, next week, NIMUX counselors will be running the Signs of Suicide Prevention Program, or the SOS program, and this is focused on depression awareness and suicide prevention training, and our goals in participating in this program are to help our students understand that depression um, is a treatable illness and that suicide is a preven preventable tragedy that occurs as a result of untreated depression uh, to provide students training in how to identify serious uh, depression a potential suicide risk in themselves or a friend to impress upon youth that they can help themselves or a friend by taking simple steps of talking to a trusted adult about their concerns and to teach students who they can turn to in the school for help if they need it. The SOS training will be provided to sophomores on January 14th. Um, on Friday, this Friday, DECA advisors Mr. Paris and Mr. Cody will bring 106 role-playing students to the DECA district's competition being held at Foxwood Regency on January 11th. The students will compete individually or with a partner in over 20 categories against competitors uh, from other 10 other District 7 schools. Uh, competitors are judged on their presentation skills, analysis, and creativity based on their role-play scenario, and they prepared for this event with a practice round of presentations with parents and local professionals at the end of December. On December 18th, 2018, NIMUC began the journey of bringing the portrait of the graduate to life. During the full day workshop, 22 students, three graduates, two future students from the middle school, and five educators explored the portrait, identified the skills that will be enable um, a new form of achievement, created learning adventures aligned to each of the competencies, designed a reflective process for students, and discussed the next steps to bring the portrait to life. We are looking forward to our upcoming 21st Century Learning Conference on January 23rd, where all the sessions will be aligned uh, to one of the competencies from the portrait of the graduate. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have community comments. Is there a member of the community who wishes to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move on to superintendent's comments. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, um, just for your information purposes, uh, the, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, MASS, um, is really starting to gear up the PR campaign as we're entering the budget season. Uh, in, in really calling to, to the public attention the inadequacy of the state funding formula, uh, and specifically the lack of um, action by the legislature to uh, follow through on the Foundation Budget Review Commission recommendations. So with that said, uh, they're planning a series of events, the first one being tomorrow evening, three simultaneous uh, public forums at 6 p.m., one in Fitchburg, one in Malden, and one in New Bedford. 
Um, I will be attending the one in Fitchburg. Um, having to deal with uh, the inadequacies uh, and really the inequalities in our public school systems. And I shared in the background notes a link to uh, a short film called The Tale of Two Sisters. I know, Diane, you saw it, um, and so did you, Sean, at the uh, joint conference back in November. Kind of a, a fascinating short film. Um, it's the story of uh, one, two sisters, one who's a teacher in Burlington and the other one's a teacher in Brockton. And it kind of shows the kind of savage inequalities that exist in their day-to-day mm -hmm. -day existence. And it kind of speaks to the level of funding in different communities. So um, I, you know, I, I bring that to your attention um, for your own informational purposes. I am cautiously optimistic uh, about what will be coming out within the next two weeks with regard to the state uh, funding. Um, keep in mind, the first budget that has to be out by January 23rd is the governor's budget, the House One budget. Um, it's traditionally been the most conservative of the three that we see through the budget cycle. Uh, however, there has been a commitment and a lot of messaging, including from the governor, to uh, address a, a very outdated uh, Chapter 70 formula. Uh, however, I think the, the verdict is still out there, whether you know, the, the additional funding will be strictly for urban districts and where you know, there's uh, substantial inequalities, or if it's gonna be something that uh, reaches out to the suburban districts as well. So obviously, I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, second piece is the next steps with regard to um, the Spanish Immersion Program and specifically the review report recommendations. I sent all of you an email um, last week. Uh, based upon your responses, it looks like Saturday the 26th from 9 to 12 is the best date and time for a special school committee workshop to kind of look at those specific report recommendations in a similar fashion of what we did with the middle school almost a year ago to the day. Um, I think there's a lot to sort through and um, I created over the break a kind of a framework document that kind of looks at things in six major categories. I doubt three hours will be enough to kind of go through all of those six categories. So I think what we'll do is we'll look to prioritize what are the biggest rocks, what are the, the, the high leverage um, issues. I think um, a lot of them are long-standing issues in the program um, that I think it would be really, really helpful to have dialogue between the committee the uh, admin team, but also the teachers, uh, and getting their viewpoint. So I'm really looking forward to that. And then um, something that we're really, really super proud of that we just received word, I want to say right before the Christmas break, is we have received a $1,500 grant from Boston Scientific. Um, that really was authored in a large part by Dave Quinn. Uh, in conjunction with one of our parents, uh, Lisa Young, who has children here at MISCO. And uh, Dave, talk a little bit about this grant. Yeah, so um, Mrs. Young was kind enough to approach uh, our leadership team uh, about a month before uh, the Christmas break and asked us if we might be able to put together a grant that would fit uh, their STEM initiative. It's, I believe they're called their possible grants. Uh, we are one of 10 that was funded across the uh, company. Um, and what we've decided to do is to build on the existing infrastructure that we have out in the uh, courtyard is how do we enhance and continue to grow and develop the, the Misco Hill Garden. Um, so the focal point will be to build a weather station uh, with the students in conjunction with uh, Paul Schwab, who's the 8th grade tech teacher, 7th and 8th grade tech teacher. Um, that ultimately will inform the automated watering system on when to, wa when to water and when to not. Um, the money also provides uh, funding for us to expand uh, the irrigation system to some of the other beds. Currently only one's powered by 
um, the solar panels and the uh, Raspberry Pi for automation. Um, we hope to get all four. Uh, we've been working with Ken Chouanye about providing um, the initial spigot over by some of our um, chorus classrooms that would provide water to the other beds. Uh, and then we're also going to provide some stone workups. We've got some uh, metal um, uh, uh, holders for our uh, solar panels to get them off, up off the grass, make it a little easier for our, our maintenance group. Um, so we're continuing to enhance it. We see this as a multi-year project, um, which will continue to get better and better with each passing year. So we're thankful to Boston Scientific. Um, we'll not only be providing funding, but also uh, some, some know-how, some staff members will be involved in helping us with that. So uh, we're really grateful for the opportunity. Job well done. And that's my report. Okay. Next, we move on to administrators' comments. So we'll hear about the MERSD Design Challenge 2018. With Dave Quinn. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, our body, it's, it's great to be with you once again. Um, so the week before vacation, um, what we decided to do as part of our uh, district action plan, you approved two design challenges for our district. The first one took place. The first one took place um, during the week before vacation. Um, we did it at each of the schools. Uh, at the elementary schools, we were able to um, do two sessions of about 200 kids in each of the cap in the cafeteria. Uh, at the high school, we had about 250 students who participated in the gym last period, right before the break on Thursday. Um, so we were really excited to have them all together. At the middle school, it's a little too big of a group to um, get in one space. Um, I guess we're just not going to connect today. Um, do you, do you want to send me something and maybe I can connect it? Um, yeah, I can send it along. There you go. No, that's me. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I saw lifesavers. I was distracted. Just to go. Now I do have to put that in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, I can send it along to you. There's no use in putting this piece. It's going to be okay. in the minutes. So I apologize for the delay. That's odd that you're getting airplay codes up there off a map book, right? No, if you haven't ever connected, or if you don't recently connect it, it will go. Oh, okay. Is it a Google Slides? Um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a PowerPoint presentation. Oh. Why don't you just hook up? Hardwire in. Do I can actually airplay. Go old school. Yeah, why, why, why don't we do that? Yeah, that, that, that sounds reasonable. Okay, so is there any unfinished business? No, there's not.
Uh, no, there is not. Okay. <laughs> so new business. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so around the agenda and going to new business, our first item is the Nipmuc Food for Thought Lunches Intent and Outcomes. Dave thought he was in a good position. He's like, oh, thank goodness I'm before John and Mary. <laughs> Thanks for the chance to be here. Happy New Year, everyone. We're glad to share out a little of the work that we've been doing through Food for Thought Lunches. Um, something we've talked a little bit about um, in past meetings, but we're glad to give you a little more detail about it. Um, so for us, Food for Thought Lunches are a way to get uh, information from kids directly. Here, help them get involved in the leadership of the school and really give them a voice, um, not only to express concerns about day to day, but also um, to contribute to strategic planning and also really to celebrate the awesome stuff that's going on and connect directly with teachers. So we want to walk you through what a Food for Thought lunch looks like and then talk to you a little bit about how we're running this process. We began them last year and ran probably um, enough that we had over 200 kids participate, so more than 10 Food for Thought lunches. Ran them on just about a monthly basis, by monthly basis. It's a chance where we have kids come in, and essentially we start by just having lunch together. Very casually, we sit down, uh, have a chat for about 20 minutes or so, and then our students get up and walk around and begin making, them making their way to questions that are posted on the wall. We have big pieces of chart paper, and all the students get a marker. We play some music, it's very light and conversational, and they make their way around the room answering questions and really giving us some feedback on, and we'll share what some of those questions are in just a minute, giving us feedback on the day-to-day, -day, the big picture, what's working, and how we can grow. All of last year, NITMUC was involved in a strategic planning process, so the district ran its process in the spring. NITMUC had a parallel process that ran throughout the school year, and really we were thinking about how are we gonna get kids involved in this, and how are we gonna give them a voice, and how are we gonna capture the feedback that we need to really make sure that we're reflective of student input. So. These have been a great venue for us to do that. Our kids make, a way, make, make their way around, share out thoughts, and then we spend about a half an hour processing. So all the students go to a sheet of poster paper, and they find a question that they're interested in, and someone else's thought that they didn't write, but they're comfortable sharing out, and we have a conversation. It's super informal, but it allows us the chance to hear from so many different kids, and um, selfishly, from our perspective, we've had a chance to get to know so many of the students right through the door, and we've seen some leaders emerge through this process, and they're really taking on a big role with the strategic planning process. So what we want to do is walk you through some of the questions and what we're doing with all this information. So one other thing, you saw some teachers in there. Our teachers voluntarily sign up for these. Um, we put out what we call a learning opportunity stock at the beginning of the year, which kind of details all the different ways that teachers can you know, professionally engage outside of their traditional classroom responsibilities over the course of the year. Um, and last year, I think we had almost every educator in the building sign up to be a part of a food for thought lunch. So when they do that, they're giving up their lunch and their prep, essentially, because it's an entire block where they're not teaching. And they come have lunch with the students, but they're part of the process, too, in terms of listening to the feedback from students, asking clarifying questions. Um, and they've all talked about just the impact of having that time. I think when we're in our classrooms, we very much, you know, focused on content and skills in the day-to-day -day and having that downtime to just have conversations with kids has been powerful. But talking about the questions, so this year um, we changed the questions a little bit from last year because we had um, adopted the new portrait of the graduate. We decided it was time to dig in with our students in terms of that as well. So every Food for Thought lunch this year we've pulled, kind of inserted a different competency into those blanks. So what specific skills related to being a global citizen do students need to be successful in their future? So we're asking kids that question. And then the follow-up to that on a different sheet of paper is what types of experiences do you believe that all students should have before they graduate in order to help them become a global citizen? So really trying to capture that data from the kid's perspective. I think we can sit around and educate as educators and think of all those things, but um, hearing it from the kids is a pretty powerful experience as well. So that was one category, Portrait of the Graduate. Second is talking about reimagining school. We talked to our students a lot about kind of the future of school. One of the things we recognize is that um, our students are some of our most traditional thinkers. Um, so helping them to explore um, what school could be is important for us. So the first question, the words we use impact our beliefs. As we reimagine school, we need your help to build a new glossary of terms. How would you replace the following words? 
Um, and not that we're to a place to replace them, but getting kids to think outside the box a little bit. Um, this is a neat exercise. The example we give them is homework. Homework evokes certain feelings and emotions, um, and there are certain expectations around that word. If we change that word, does it change the kind of emotions around it too, or the expectations that come with that? We've talked too about the idea of the main office, the idea of getting sent to the principal's office. Right. How often we're seeing kids to celebrate them or congratulate, and they walk through that. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> but when you change the name of that, and so some of the ideas that have been fun. I know that, mitochondria. You know, what if they have all kinds of crazy. The welcome center. The welcome center. Maybe you're welcome. <laughs> Center, it completely changes sure. your perception of what the main office is. Yeah. Like, intentional vocabulary goes along the way. Beyond grades and test scores, how would a school know if it's successful? So kind of the idea of redefining success. You know, what, how would kids think yeah. that school would be successful? And what would a school look like in which students were thriving? So we talk about the district mission, empower all students to thrive, and really digging in in terms of what does that mean for our students. So exploring that. And the final category is student feedback. Um, and this has been last year too, we, we talked a lot about student feedback. What learning experiences do you look forward to the most? What do you wish your teachers and administrators knew? And what is one way that we could make Nipmuc a more enjoyable, fun place to be every day? So a big part of the Food for Thought lunches is talking to the kids about it's not just the hour that they're with us, it's about doing something with this. So we um, take time to take the data and do something with it. So we collect all the responses off the pieces of paper we like log them all digitally so we have a list of all the responses that any student ever gave us over the course of the last two years but then we take them and we make them into word clouds um, we use the word clouds from last year when we were talking about our beliefs about learning at the high school so we're able to very quickly take hundreds of pieces of data and have them available for someone to look at and pull key themes and ideas out of so this is what learning experiences do you look forward to the most well, this is one of my favorite moments of all our lunches this last Thursday when one of our teachers, Justin Townsend, was looking at this sheet of paper that the kids had filled out, and he said what's most interesting to him is what was not on that list, and he talked about sort of like note-taking and some of the traditional PowerPoint presentations, some of the traditional things that have had been part of school, and he didn't see that show up there, and it was just an aha moment, I think, for everybody in the room. This one was a question we asked last year and it continued into this year as well, but you see the big word there, homework. It was neat that we had all the data that kind of coincided with the same time that the um, district homework committee, um, so we were able to use a lot of the students' responses and data when we were exploring that, um, but the theme of homework and time comes up all you know frequently. Next one, what is one way we could make Nipmuc a more enjoyable, fun place? We'll go over them all, but give you a second to look at them. Beyond grades and test scores, how would you know if, how would a school know if it is um, successful? So we're talking about kids being happy, it being a community of learners, being able to apply what they're learning. We had sort of a, one of our veteran students from Food for Thought lunches today presented to faculty at our faculty meeting about some of the work that we've been doing. And she was talking about school and how a great school you can't always measure quantitatively, and it's about the qualitative feedback. And I don't know if her mindset would have been there without the conversations we've had in Food for Thought lunches. So as much as it is a chance to get feedback from them and capture their thoughts, it's also a great chance to just use it as an educational opportunity. So we're all talking together about what we want for school. This one's a neat one as well. What would a school look like when students were thriving? So talking about kids, about what it means to thrive. Again, you see happy, come out, but excited to learn. They talk a lot about that. They talk about it about mental wellness coming into it in the community, um, which is neat. These are, these word clouds were a compilation of them, so what specific skills related to all of the competencies? I put them into one word cloud, there wasn't enough from each individual one. Um, I'm assuming open is referring to open-minded, there's an open mind and open-minded, so I think they kind of disperse, but I think that's what open referred to. And the next one was experiences, again, a compilation of all the competencies within the portrait of the graduate. Is that the last one? Yeah. Great. Great. So as Marianne said, we've been really intentional about the portrait of the graduate and the new district mission and trying to get people to engage with it. One of the things that um, we did sort of as an offshoot of the Food for Thought lunches was to take some time and explore the portrait of the graduate. And we had, at Nitmuck for years, been running 
the measurement of what we call 21st century learning expectations. As part of our work with accreditation is to have skills that we thought all kids needed in order to be able to graduate, to be successful in the world beyond our school. And we developed those over a period of years and developed rubrics and our students were assessed on those skills a couple of times per year, came home with report cards, I'm sure you've seen it. This year we put that on hiatus so that we could transition from our 21st century learning expectations to the portrait of the graduate. And we've taken, we've taken a year to really dig in and figure out what it means to be successful with this. So part of that work was giving students a voice. So we ran a workshop, as Lily mentioned in her notes. Um, it was about 30 students, a couple of graduates, um, some students from the middle school, a seventh and eighth grader, and some teachers who joined us for a full day workshop on December 18th. What we did was we dug into the portrait of the graduate and we looked at some of the skills that are involved in the portrait of the graduate. I'm gonna jump out of the presentation for one second just to bring you to the website. And I just emailed this to you so you can check it out later if you want. But, um, and this lives on our Lead Learners website. What we did in that full day workshop was to start by exploring the strategic plan. We had the kids go through the strategic plan and pull out some of the key words that, were, that they noticed when they looked at it. And we did what was called a snowball fight, a great Dave Quinn idea, where the kids went into the strategic plan, they pulled out a word that jumped out to them, they wrote it on a sheet of paper, crumpled it up, threw it across the room. And then someone else picked it up, looked at it, and wrote a question that they had related to that term. So we did a few rounds of that, and we asked the kids what they were curious about when they looked at the plan. And the, the ideas, the questions they had were just so impressive, and we got the sense that they understood the spirit of the strategic plan in a really short period of time. Um, how can we tell, how can all students and learners thrive throughout the school day? How can we inspire and motivate students? Uh, what actions, attitudes, and behaviors make people feel empowered? So from the outset, they began to dig into sort of the higher level thought of what the strategic plan is all about. From there, we began connecting it to professions, dug into what professions, use the different skills that are embodied in the portrait of the graduate. So you can see, and you'll be able to check this out later, for each of the six skill sets, they named all the professions that they could think of that needed it, needed that skill. We then had them turn the paper over and write down any careers they could think of that wouldn't use the skill. It's just sort of a hold your breath moment. <laughs> <laughs> and what we found was they couldn't put anything on the other side, which was sort of proof of concept for this strategic plan that we've come up with in the Portrait of the Graduate, that when they thought about every profession out there, you're gonna need these six skills in order to be successful with them. So from there, we began, and I won't go through every aspect of this, but we began guiding the kids through the creation of a reflective tool to replace our school-wide rubrics that we could use. And um, we were able to, by the end of the day, create something that we think is gonna have a lasting place in it bring you through that through the rest of the presentation. You can see we talked about this cycle of learning or calling it where kids self-assess where they are with the portrait, set some goals related to the portrait, and then um, find some way to reflect on it. So one of the pieces that they created during the day is this reflective tool. We've made it now a digital form so that all the kids' thoughts are in this digital form and anytime they have an experience related to the portrait, they can reflect and then get answers kicked back to them. Um, one of the pieces that we discussed was the idea of what kind of learning experiences, this relates directly to the group of thought lunches, do we need to provide our kids in order to help them be successful with the portrait of the graduate? And we came up this, with this idea of learning adventures in that looking at the six skill areas, yes, they relate to our disciplines, math, English, science, et cetera, but there's a more aspirational potential that goes along with Sure, so during the day we talked about the, the term learning experience versus learning adventure, um, and the kids kind of articulated their thoughts about both in terms of, you know, what an appropriate name would be, and they talked about, you know, feeling like adventure um, was not something you needed to master. There was kind of an expectation that there would be failure and success through an adventure. Um, you know, so they like that term when we started to dig into it, but when we think of learning adventures, we think, you know, non-traditional in a sense, um, because I think they're, you know, we think interdisciplinary rather than the disciplines in which um, high school is traditionally separated. And then making sure that they're active, you know, and then that was another piece we talked about with the word adventure. There's action involved with adventure. You're not sitting in a classroom consuming information. Um, and memorable, they leave kind of this lasting impact, right? And also talked about 
And um, we talked about it today um, when Brenna and another teacher, Brenna Seligman, a student and a teacher got up about the idea that a learning adventure is only as good as the reflection that you have after that, right? If we're reflecting on it and we're growing from it, we're connecting it to the portrait, that's what's going to make these powerful learning experiences. So one of the pieces we're really excited for and um, we talked about earlier too is the 21st Century Learning Conference. So our 21st Century Learning Conference at the end of January this year is being aligned to the portrait of the graduate. So we're kind of taking that idea of learning adventures um, and saying, well, what are, if we were given an hour, a half day, a full day, what kinds of adventures could we create for kids? So each of the sessions throughout the day will be aligned to the portrait of the graduate, and then we're gonna be piloting that reflection tool at the end of the day. So those, the last 20 minutes of the day, kids are gonna go to their advisories, and we're going to be able to use that Google form to start collecting to see if the work that the kids put together, and it's really the work from that workshop that the, the students can, the I can statements, so if I'm a global citizen, I can do, you know, what are the things, and again, you can dig into it, and then um, the reflective prompts that our students created, so um, this will be our first chance to dig in, and we'll see how it goes, and we'll see kind of the products, and then be able to tweak it from there as we go on. Coming out of this, so each of our 651 kids will reflect on the 21st Century Learning Conference. They'll reflect on how they grew with the portrait of the graduate. And then all their reflections are going to kick back to their advisors and their small group advisors. And again, we're just thinking about how do we make this thing actionable? How do we move forward with the portrait and make it tangible? And when you talk about it in theory, it sounds great, but we wanted to see if we could put a face on the portrait of our graduates. So we're going to run a pilot program this coming year based on the reflections that come out of the 21st Century Learning Conference, where we're going to look for about 20 students who will have the chance to earn an extra quarter credit and be coached through the development of a digital portfolio. They'll have a chance to work with a professional photographer who will help them create a portfolio that is fun and lively and expression of who they are. And uh, they'll create this, this digital space that we'll be able to share out on the district website and also on our blog to sort of show to community members this is the many different faces of the portrait of the graduate. We have a lot of different strengths and abilities and talents and curiosities in the school, and we think that through the conference we're going to be able to highlight that. We're also going to recognize those kids on our graduation time and awards day to give, hold them up as an example of what the portrait looks like. So again, using it as a chance to explore it, I said to the faculty today, we're kind of building the plane while we fly it, which is exciting because we're, we've got this uh, great call to action through the district strategic plan, and now we're seeing what it can look like in, in practice. Let's get down to the other one. Sure. So another way that we've been talking about um, the district's mission, too, I don't know if any of you saw it, I know some of you were there to, to witness it, but um, we took our high honors dinner this year in which we celebrate um, our scholars that earn high honors in each of the four terms of the previous year, um, and it's a long-standing tradition at Nipmuc, but really tried to connect it back to um, a new story of success and who our kids really are, because we know they're way more than the grades that show up on their report cards. So we're trying to take opportunities like that to really highlight the individuals that exist in our school, and I think in the district's mission of Empower All Learners to Thrive, there's that individual piece, because we know that all individuals don't thrive under the same circumstances. So really trying to pull that out. So it's linked up there as well, but if you haven't had the opportunity, that's a neat way um, to see the mission as well come to life. Going backwards one, we go backwards sure. one. So this we put up there, this was something we started this year, and it's built off of the success of our Food for Thought lunches last year, actually. So um, getting to connect with kids over the course of the year and really getting to know them and what makes them tick and their thoughts and opinions was powerful. So Coming into this year, we wanted to do that with our freshmen right away. We did not want to say, over the course of your four years, we'll have the opportunity to get to know you. So we actually took the model of Food for Thought lunches and went into every freshman English class. Different questions about welcoming them to NIPMUC and things that they're interested in and um, ways to give their feedback right from the start that they would be able to see in action. Um, and we're able to, in the first month of school, meet with every single freshman and give them the opportunity to have a voice and um, you know, make an impact on their community, which was a great experience. Yeah, it was done food for thought question style, so they got comfortable with that format, comfortable interacting with us. And some of the questions even the same, the ones we asked in food for thought lunches, but 
Now, I, I think the main theme of what we're talking about here is in interacting with our kids, yes, it's a warm and fuzzy moment and a connection is built and it helps the relationship. And we value that so much. At the same time, it's also been something that because we're intentional about the questions we're asking, we feel like the students' input and the faculty feedback has allowed us to now put some actions in place. Um, I don't know where we're gonna be at the end of the year, but I know we're gonna have a lot of information to reflect on and see where it's, we're going as a district. We were really grateful too that um, when we ran that portrait of the graduate workshop, Joe and Maureen and district principals showed up and some of the educators in the school took the prep walk up to come see and interact with the kids. So it's been um, just an ongoing conversation about what we're doing and um, we think the results are pretty exciting. We also are really interested in sharing this work out with the community beyond network as well. And so we wanted to mention too, coming up on Friday, we have our seventh PD um, session that we're running for local educators. We have about 20 folks coming from other schools and we're gonna be talking to them about 21st century learning conferences, how to put them together. We're beginning to see these pop up in local school communities, which is really cool. Just real big believers that this is not work that MERSDA should be taking on all by itself and that this idea of evolving school and reimagining what things we can do for our kids is a lot easier when we have um, all communities involved and have sharing that mindset. So we're excited to share that work out. And, and we just added this slide right at the beginning of the meeting because we just got some exciting news from the Upton Cultural Council that um, they approved a grant for the Inspired Learning Library, which is a grant we put, put together this fall. Um, and we're waiting to hear back on. So it is an $800 grant that will support buying professional literature about reimagining school and the work that's being done to get books not only into the hands of our students, but into the hands of our community members with the understanding um, that as we purchase these books and put them out into the community and community members pass them from one community to member to another community member, that we are going to continue to educate our community, get them excited about the things that we're excited about. Um, and even more connected to our strategic plan. So super excited about that. You just got that grant right after the pledge to the flag. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a simple slide, but you get the point. The, the idea that we're going to take this great literature that we've been reading as a leadership team, the teachers in the region that take participating in book study, and you just pass it. And your only obligation is to make sure that you keep the book sent passed on to someone else. We have um, interns in the main office at school who will be in charge of tracking the books through the community. And we're going to hold an annual event where we get everybody who read a book or borrowed a book together to sort of talk about what they learned, what they saw, have a little book conversation. And hopefully this is something that will grow and continue to spread throughout the community. So we're excited about that. That's, really good. That's, That's it. Great. Very exciting. Very commendable work. Yeah, a lot of good things going on. Okay, um, so our design challenge was based around a kill the sound on that. Um, around a holiday tradition. I don't know if your house, but certainly around my house. Okay, um, um, so our design challenge was based around a stream open days. Um, around a holiday tradition. I don't know if your house, but certainly around my house. Okay, um, so our design challenge was based around a holiday tradition. Jay, you must have a YouTube stream. Right. <laughs> I was watching it because I can't see the screen. I think That's why I'm superintended. I can just figure stuff out. Right. 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 Good luck. Like that. Yeah, I'll figure where that, that sound was coming from. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, so a, a low light and MURSD technology, but I think we're good for right now. Um, so again, so we, we built the challenge around a holiday favorite. Uh, build a home, as you probably recognize the logo from Home Alone. Um, and before I get started, I just want to say thank you to uh, a lot of people who put in a ton of work to do this, uh, mainly the Breakfast Club, which is a group of elementary teachers, um, again, tied into the strategic plan and the action plan of trying to build an innovation team. Um, so we've got uh, Katie Jordan, Katie Dutton, Allison White, Esther Walensky, 
uh, who are the core components of it right now. We're looking to expand into the middle and the high school. High school breakfast club will be pretty early, so it might be a, a little bit more of an afternoon group. Um, we went to a PD session with Gary Stager up in Boston on one of our PD days, and this idea kind of emanated out from there. Um, but Paul Schwab and Marie Brigham and Kristen Berthea were instrumental in organizing the materials. Um, Marie Brigham and Kristen Berthea, true to form as, as math educators, turned the organization into a math challenge and, and organizing the materials. So did they have enough? How were they best sorted out? Um, and then um, Sam O'Neill and Emily Dodge, two of our technicians, uh, were absolutely crucial in setting up and making it possible. Um, so the, the driving force behind this is trying to create an opportunity for playful learning. Um, and you know, I pulled the slide from imagination.org because I think this gets at the core of what we try to accomplish in this task, but also the type of learning that we want to experience. Um, so first, do we give students a inspirational challenge? Uh, do we give them time to imagine what the solutions to that challenge would be? Um, and then, you know, moving into that build phase. So we, we have a, we take a constructionist approach to learning. How are students making or making objects to think with? Um, but then that play piece comes in critically, and you'll see that throughout our uh, our challenge here because we don't want them just to build and then forget. We, we have them play with it, so they tinker with it and they make it better. And then finally, there's a sharing component to this. So how do we uh, enable students or give students an opportunity to have a, a little bit of skin in the game, present what they've learned, um, and uh, you know show it to a larger audience than just a teacher or just their classmates? Uh, so this was kind of the driving mindset behind it, and, and you'll see it's really closely aligned to our portrait of the graduate, right? So you are not able to achieve any of these goals if you're not a skillful collaborator. Uh, you're not able to imagine if you're not an inspired innovator. Um, if you're not a solution seeker, it's really hard to design, to solve these design challenge. A mindful learner is able to manage the emotions of working within a group, which can sometimes be challenging, um, and to you know uh, be an effective communicator to share what they're feeling, share their ideas. Uh, so all the work that we're trying to do is, is build it into an alignment with the strategic plan. Um, so we framed it around, uh, so one of the challenges that you have within a design challenge is how do you make something that's simple enough and accessible for a kindergartner, but also you can level up and challenge it for, you know, 12th grader. Um, so the first grade teachers do this amazing unit uh, on building with the three little pigs, and I was in Lauren Poxon's class. Um, and uh, we, were, we were working on this challenge, and I thought to myself, well, what might this look like if a middle school did it or if a 12th grader did it? Um, and it also kind of brings a kind of a fun entry point for them. So they had to build a home for Wilbur, um, and they were told that they were going to be provided with a series of materials, so just very simple materials, right? So craft sticks, tape, uh, straws, and um, index cards. And so could you construct a home for Wilbur that would survive a visit from the Big Bad Wolf. Um, so for the, the kindergartners and the fourth grades, your challenge is to build an interesting home that would survive um, a, a strong huff and puff from the Big Bad Wolf. At the secondary level, we wanted to add a height requirement to it um, that would also survive the Big Bad Wolf. And then also, Wilbur shouldn't be moving when he's in the house. right? So we tried to get add a layer of authenticity. We also built in some other constraints that the, the, the house had to have a roof. Uh, again, it had to be 12 inches high. Uh, at the secondary level, we didn't provide the students with ample uh, amounts of any one material, so they had to barter, so there was a bit of an economics aspect to it uh, to get what they needed. And then, you know, we think the time constraint is important because that uh, allows them to think quickly to, to wrap the prototype. Um, we also provided them with the design advice, and, you know, you've seen a lot of the design thinking models which talks about, you know, empathizing with the user, getting a perspective on what their needs are. We, we kind of did that for them with uh, talking about Wilbur and it's cold outside and, and we want to make sure that he's both protected from the elements and from the Big Wolf. You know, define what the problem so you had to build a house. But really focus on these three core concepts which I think translates into almost any work that you're going to do. So, sorry, no problem. So, creating ideas, prototyping, so going from idea to action to build, and then testing. Because what you really want to do is you want to fail fast so you can identify the flaws in your design to make it better. And I think that's, that's something that we're really trying to do within the district no matter what discipline. Um, but this is a chance to do it hands-on and to uh, give them a context that the teachers can draw upon. To say, remember when you did the design challenge, we, the, the goal was to continually make it better even if you're successful. This is also an opportunity to build in um, the social-emotional efforts that the elementary schools are doing. So the 
uh, idea of soar and rise were introduced or reintroduced at the beginning of the presentation, that students were, were, were expected to live up to these core values, and this was a chance to demonstrate it within it. And uh, as you can see, we, we tried, so one of the things that I thought uh, Jane Gallagher did really excellently last year with the, the Marshmallow Challenge, which is kind of the influence for it, is that she had multiple grades in one space. And I think there's just a certain excitement that comes when you've got kids, particularly with different grade levels, all sharing a space. They can see what each other's are doing. There's an excitement, there's a buzz, and it's, it's a, as much of a learning experience as a show. Um, and you'll see that we had the, the time, we had music playing. So we're creating a, a, you know, a learning adventure here in our district. Um, and I think the goal, and in some cases we were successful, is we wanted to be the thing that you were talking about at the kitchen table. Um, so we tried to create that type of atmosphere. Um, we were also revising kind of on the fly here. So the original test called for just some hair dryers. And what we found out really quickly or, was that they were able to survive the hair dryers, no problem. So we decided to up the ante a little bit. And we got one of those industrial floor dryers uh, to bring in to you know, uh, increase the challenge of the task. And so again, it, it provided a great opportunity for students to you know, both work independently and collaboratively. I think these two illustrations illustrate students communicating with each other. In some points, you're, you're trying to work uh, independently to start to construct. And then you can see with these young kindergartners that they are, are putting together, they're working and discussing what they're, they're acting upon. Um, and then just, just a quick video to show, to demonstrate uh, very quickly that we had the students test their designs along the way. So the clock is still ticking, but we encourage students to come and figure out, you know, what were the limitations and the flaws in their design early on. All right, so again, failing fast, go back and start to work. And the first group to do it is, is always the most timid because that's not how we do it in school. We turn the work in, we're ready for the teacher to move on. Um, but once one group saw, once the first group went, then it was just a flood and we had to you know, get more and more hair dryers in. And again, it's reinforcing that idea of tests to make it better. Um, these are some of, so the designs are really interesting. What we found was that the, um, the triangular and circular designs were the most successful. Um, one fourth grade student who designed uh, this really simple uh, design uh, talked about watching a magic school bus episode where circles are most effective against the wind because the wind goes right around it. So we're giving them, think about trees, right? Trees are pretty resi resilient in wind because the wind just goes around. Uh, triangles are also super resilient as well. Um, in reflecting, I would love to try to, for our, our spring design challenge to tie in more of the content aspect of this because it's a really authentic learning experience to tie in core scientific uh, concepts. The focus here was more about test and building some of those more soft skills in communication. Um, but I think it was a really kind of unique opportunity. Um, one student came up to Mrs. Gentile. You always talk about the power of the triangle. That's why we use that in terms of the design. Um, and again, there's that show piece of it. So the students are all coming up. They test them in public. Um, I had a lot of fun with it, but I don't think I had the most fun with it um, because I think there's one person who had more fun with it. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if, if laughs and smiles and high fives were all currency, I could retire mm -hmm. today because the kids were really thoroughly enjoying themselves as part of this process. Um, what was really awesome, too, was that, you know, you had the same experience at the high school. Um, you know, as, as Marianne Moran pointed out to me during the time that, you know, the kids were all hands-on engaged. If they had their cell phones out, it was only because they were taking pictures of what they created. So for the Thursday, right before vacation, you know, in, in some cases, it can, you know, their attention is elsewhere. How do you create an experience where they were locked in? And I think this hit it. Um, this is one of my other favorite pictures. Marianne pointed it out to me. Um, look at them holding up their designs. They were proud of them. This was them being asked to be called on for the next ones to be tested. And if you look at the photos, the kids are locked in. They want to see what happens. So how do we create this need to know? How do we create this little learning adventure? right here in Men Enough. It's going to look a lot differently. We're hoping to you know, do much bigger than this, but how do we create that kind of feeling and experience right off the bat? Um, at the end, uh, at the elementary and secondary level, 
Uh, we had them do a quick reflection on Flipgrid. We asked them to think about what they would do to continue to improve their design. Again, that idea of continuous improvement. Um, you know, and then also think about the group work. How did they interact with each other? Um, what could they have done to better facilitate uh, the conversation? Um, in reflecting on my own practice, we need to build more time for that. Um, you know, I think the build takes an awful lot of time. But um, you know, we posted up on Flipgrid for uh, teachers to see. Um, but again, I think it's one of those things that, that needs to be valued and brought in and embedded in, instead of just one off. Um, so where we'd like to go, uh, one of the other aspects of our strategic plan, particular our action plan, is to continue to cultivate a relationship with um, MIT. They're doing a lot of work in beyond rumors. So how do we assess this type of maker education? And they come up with these, these core uh, values, which you'll see are, are really aligned with with our strategic plan. So how do we teach students the design process? How do we give them the agency to um, choose what they're making? How do we uh, enable them to take productive risks? Again, a lot of this is going to be trial and error. Um, how do we help them to tinker and troubleshoot when their design doesn't work the first time, or their essay doesn't work the first time, or their equation doesn't work the first time, um, or their mission to Mars if their first iteration doesn't work the first time? Uh, and then that these two pieces, I think, are really critical here. So how do we bridge knowledge across disciplines? And how do we build content knowledge into these designs? So I think if we're successful in doing what we're doing, this will be a hallmark of the type of work that we're doing uh, at Menden Upton, and that the design challenge will just be a regular part of uh, everyday learning. So uh, again, thank you for the time to share this. I look forward to the spring. And if you're interested in being a parent volunteer, uh, all hands on deck are, are, is a, a great way to describe uh, these type of adventures. So thank you again. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Right. Um, next item on the agenda is the nip up travel opportunity to China in June 2020. Mr. Masek. Yes, how are you doing? Well, thank you. And you? Great, great. <laughs> great. So we're looking to, well, I'm looking to plan a trip to China uh, 2020. So after the school year ends, so June 22nd to June 30th, which is a Monday to a Tuesday, it's an eight day trip. Uh, the cost per student is $3,336, and that includes many sightseeing spots. Uh, really, my goal was I really wanted to let the kids know, and me as well, I'm interested in Eastern culture and philosophy and architecture. Um, all of us kind of have a Western experience, right? A lot of us might have been to Europe or they've been to Canada or Mexico, but you really haven't been to the Far East that much. So I wanted to give the kids a flavor of that, but I also wanted to go to China because it's our number one trading partner. And I wanted the kids to kind of get a business and an economics angle on that since that's what I teach at the high school. So I worked out a deal to get a car uh, manufacturing plant in Beijing to give us a tour uh, of a production facility, operations facility, and get a question and answer quest, uh, session going with them about trade, imports and exports and currency exchanges and all sorts of different things like that. So to kind of give them a flavor about the economics relationship between the two countries. So I thought it was a great opportunity. So that's kind of why I picked China to go to China. Um, it's eight days. We're going to go to a lot of great sites. Uh, I really don't want to talk about walls right now, but going to the Great Wall of China, all right? Uh, the Forbidden City, Terracotta Warriors. We're going to go three major uh, metropolitan areas, which is Beijing, the capital. We're going to Xi'an, and we're going to go to Shanghai. All right, Shanghai is really one of the business capitals there as well. So uh, we're going to go visit with the family. We're going to go visit with doctors. We're going to have entertainment. We're going to have um, uh, different uh, um, food options for us, upgraded hotels. Um, we will have a tour guide with us at all times. And I'm going through Explorica, which you know Miss Kate Reardon runs a lot of the trips, so it's the same company. And when I talk to the representative there, this is their number one rated trip of all the trips that they have globally. The China trip is the number one rated trip. Uh, because I do not speak Mandarin, the um, uh, rep that stays with us stays with us 24 seven, sleeps with us, eats with us, guides us, takes in the bus tour. Uh, we're going to be going on a bullet train for one of the rides to the cities. We're going to fly intercontinentally in China. So we're going to be a lot of doing a lot of travel. Uh, but I think the kids will be exposed to a lot of cultural activities, a lot of uh, architectural act activities. They can see different designs. They're going to go to the water cube. They're going to go to where the bird's nest was for the Olympic Stadium. 
So you can see some of that side of it. Um, and that's really kind of it in a nutshell. fundraising opportunities for the students to yeah them. I'll have to bring on those but yes we're definitely going to try to do some fundraising opportunities right. for that, for sure. the parent meetings the same yes that's the next step um, we're going to have a 21st century day uh, coming up as as um, mrs. Moran and, and mr. Clinton spoke about and one of the sessions I want to lead is something about the China trip in there uh, so the kids can get an information session about that I have a neighbor who's studied in China for a year and she's been to all these places. So I'm trying to get her to come in and some of the representative from the company to come in or somebody who's been on that trip uh, to talk to the kids about it as well so they can ask some questions. Following that, I'd like to have a parent uh, meeting session. Okay. okay? About how to sign up and everything else through the website. Is there, is there a number, a limit? Uh, no, there's no limit, but we're looking to get around 12 to 14 kids to go, which would be two chaperones which would be uh, myself and I talked to Ms. Reardon and she has experience with going on this trip. So I asked her if she'd like to go, if we have enough kids to go and she would. So I, um, two chaperones, we're looking to get around 12 to 14 uh, kids to go, but you're more than welcome to come. I mean, you know, don't feel it's just for the kids. I mean, you're more than welcome to come too. Yes. trips are very, very exciting. And I think um, the, the great work that Rob does with um, the, the, his economics classes and in turn uh, Jim with his, and Jim will be talking about it in a minute, um, with his engineering students, I think you're talking about a different niche. I mean, a lot of times the trips that have come forward uh, have been, you know, through Spanish or through Italian and, and so on. I think you're probably going to be looking at a slightly different cohort of students that will be able to take advantage of these great opportunities. So, anyway. Okay. Any other questions? Final comments? Okay. All right. Motion to approve the trip. Motion to approve the China trip for Second. 2020. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So if Jim maybe could talk about this great opportunity uh, for Finland for this coming April. Absolutely. So um, I, over the past seven years, have worked with a NASA astronaut and engineer, and he's senior advisor for innovation down at NASA. He kind of helped him start this program at the high school level. Um, and he's reached out to Finland and they have over 500 students at the university and some high school levels because their education system is a little different. Um, and they reached out, I met them in May, May, June last year. They reached out interest for us to go over and uh, kind of team up and share ideas and present to each other and see how things worked out that way. Um, and they followed up this November with a formal invite to come this April, um, end of April. So it'll be the week after vacation. Um, us and a group from New Jersey have been invited to go over to Yenensu. So we fly from Boston over directly right into Yenensu, which is a small city in Finland. Stay there at the university, kind of work with them for the week or so less than a week. Might be helpful to talk about what your students are doing, like how this relates to like the, the projects they're working on and what the students are going to be doing when they're Yeah, working. so we're all involved in um, what Dr. Kamara terms an epic challenge. Um, so the epic challenge for this year is uh, how would you have a sustainable human colony on Mars, which ranges the students can pick any problem from Earth, logistics, how do you start the whole mission, all the way to getting to Mars, what do you do for six to nine months in a tin can while you're going there, um, to how you set up a, a colony. Could be engineering a society, what rules are in place, because it's a multi-international thing. Could be how do you grow food, how do you recycle, how do you use what's there, um, to how do you travel and transport information back and forth. Um, so the students really get to pick um, 
from a wide breadth of whatever they're interested in and start tackling those problems and learn the engineering process through that, um, their own interest, instead of me picking out something for them to do. They're looking in this wide range, finding what they like, and really latching onto it and developing projects. So this past week, we had um, a symposium with Mrs. Willis, uh, Wilson's AP Biology class. They did AP Biology projects, research projects. My students um, were following up on their research and created posters to present their research proposals, which now they're going to start prototyping. So by the time we get to Finland, we'll have um, presentations about our prototypes for them. And they'll share back, and then we can um, interface that way and interact with them. I was wondering what that was all about. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm exposed to the biology side, not the... Okay, the yeah. Side. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But I, I do have to say, um, I think it was last Thursday yes. that uh, the two of you had your students in the library all day. So super impressive as far as the quality of work, but also the completely professional and composed manner in which the students presented. It was outstanding. It really was. Um, and I think thinking about just the presentation, uh, going, having the opportunity for your students to go to Finland and to present to their peers, but also to present to an international audience is, is just a tremendous opportunity. So kudos. Uh, super, super happy you're on board within our district with this NASA connection and continue the great work, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, we hope this is just kind of like a waypoint along the way. Yeah. So ultimately, hopefully at the end of the year, they'll travel down to Kennedy Space Center and present to NASA scientists down there their results. Now, I have to say that the, when you listen to the presentation, the level of seriousness the students had made me wonder, Oh, holy cow, what's going on? Like, I'm missing something. Yeah, no, it's all designed to prep them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the level. Yeah, when exactly. you get down there, they, I mean, they're NASA scientists. They know every angle. So, And the students have to do a 20-minute presentation up there. And the, I tell them there's no little screen like this. It's a 40-foot <laughs> by 40-foot large screen. You're right in front of it. There's no reading off of it. <laughs> yeah. And at the end of the 20 minutes, you're going to get grilled. So they have to, you know, I'm trying to build them up to that level. Yeah, that's really exciting. Thank you. So the students that are participating in this, how, how, do, how do they get involved with this? Or is this just part of the engineering class? There's the engineering class, and then there's an after school club where we have um, at least three students that have done projects. OK. Yeah. Outside of the class, just on their own interest. I wouldn't, maybe at some point, I mean, we, we, we definitely have a package agenda uh, in January, but I really do think maybe in a school committee me meeting in February or March, it would be really great for the committee to see, you know, maybe two or three groups, just, just their presentation alone, just the professional nature, to kind of give a snapshot of the work and the depth and the breadth of the work, I think would be terrific, Jeff. Sure. Let me okay. know. We'll yeah. I mean, set living, it up. living on the volcanic tubes on Mars is an awesome <laughs> presentation. The what? The volcanic tube. Oh, the exactly. volcanic tube. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was very good. Sorry, we just found out today one of the students um, found online. Um, last year I had my students make Martian soil, so we bought all the chemicals and we made it ourselves. But one of the students now, there's a company that does it, and um, I said, okay, let me write them. And they're sending us at least 20 pounds of Martian simulant. That's like over $150. Wow. I don't know how these things happen. They just, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's awesome. So, yeah, so the kids will be growing with real Martian simulant soil and figuring out what to add, how much compost, what chemicals, but, you know. It's good to know that it's going to arrive in the main office. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the welcome center? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got that during staff meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gordon, is there, the is there a fundraising well. opportunity for this? Yes. Yep. Um, there's what we call space camp, 
run it in conjunction with um, Northbridge High School, where um, it'll be February vacation for kids from fifth to eighth grade to come spend the week from Tuesday of February vacation to Friday in the morning, like eight to noon. Um, information went out through the fifth to eighth grade, I believe, in flyers. Um, I'm gonna do moon landing. I'm also gonna build landers learn about it. Um, we'll have Dr. Kamara Skype in and talk to the students, give them encouragement, and uh, evaluate their final designs and just have a good time working as a team and figuring out the engineering design process. We ran a uh, first time last year, had a huge success with it, um, so we hope to have another one this year. Cool. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? No. Um, so, we'll entertain a motion to approve the Finland trip in April 2019. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the Finland trip in, it's in April, right? It's yeah, in it's April. April. Wow. wow, April 2019. Yeah, short turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Yes, second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And the trip is approved unanimously. Thank, thank you. you. Sounds exciting. Not yeah. to be out of order, we just want to say thank you. Support some of trips from Iceland, the sightseeing trips in Europe, yeah. um, Galapagos, and these two. And thanks to Jim and Rob and all the other mm -hmm. teachers put forward. We really appreciate it. I mean, it's a ton of time and effort that goes into it, and uh, we're really grateful. So great opportunities for our students. Right. Really I think are. the same thing, especially right. when you're talking about portrait of a graduate. This is what it's all about. This is an adventure. It's a global <laughs> citizenship. Yeah. It's about collaboration. I mean, you know, and again, I, I don't mean to be overly effusive in my praise, but I was blown away by the presentations that I saw in the library in the sense that it wasn't kids nervously standing in front of iPads and reading bullet points off a of PowerPoint. It was kids speaking with authority, making eye contact with me, ask, engaging me, asking me questions, and so on. I can honestly say 29 years as an educator, I've never seen high school kids present in such a professional manner with such poise. Which is amazing, yeah. and that's what we're asking them to exactly. do. <laughs> exactly. And they're doing it. And I it. think it speaks also to the amount of choice and ownership the students themselves mm -hmm. feel. As you said, it's not what I, the teacher, want you to do or parrot back. It's you. It's a you search. You know, you mm -hmm. personally need to discover your reason for doing research, for putting together a proposal, and on both sides of the room, since I had a twin on either side, that it was definitely amazing how they were engaged, they were excited, and there was not a phone out, it was, you know, and they worked as a team, which was amazing as well. For the whole day, they did. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. It really, Very really cool. was stunning. It's a stunning example of scholarship. Loved it. I completely agree. All right. Um, Okay, so next, are there any matters not anticipated 48 hours before this posted meeting? Hearing none, or none on my behalf. Um, our future agenda items include the Mercy Golden Apple Award presentation on January 28th and the Mercy FY 2020 First Pass budget also on January 28th. Um, okay, and so that's about it. Anything else to add? Okay, hearing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, all those in favor, we want to adjourn. Aye. 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 <laughs> all right, meeting is adjourned at 8.15. Thank you all. Have a lovely few weeks until we see you again on the 28th, I'm sure. Sounds <laughs> good. Thank you.